I grew up fishing and being on the river and being over at the family's traditional home spot. You know, Europe people have always been right here, and our family specifically has always been right here. You know, um, we have a non-native mom, of course, but like our dad's family has always been from this place. And so we have a family hole down the way here that my ancestors have fished since the beginning of time, and here we are. Two thousand two was the year that the largest fish kill in American history occurred on the Klamath River within the boundaries of the Yurok Reservation. I was working as a fisheries technician, and I remember, you know, being on the boat, going up and down the river, and seeing more of the fish dying, and just thinking to myself. My great-grandmother, Geneva Matz, is rolling over in her grave right now. I decided that I would go to law school and hopefully prevent something like that from ever happening again. I really fell in love with Indian law. And I remember I would just stay up late and like read the Indian law casebook. And it's that one right there with the duct tape on it. I began to understand the legal and political undertones that had informed the last, I don't know, four or five generations of my family, basically since non-natives came to Requa. The gist of the story is that 1855, they reserve our way of life and they, they promise to us this fishing way of life. And then you got the dams, you have the reclamation project, you have the Trinity River Division, all acts approved by the Congress that are directly contrary to Yurok's rights. So this is my great-grandmother, Geneva Matz, and she's in front of the family's traditional redwood plank house out in Requa. And that's her in her traditional uh, you know, regalia. And I think she had such an interesting life because she was born right around, I think it was 1903, and passed in 1986. And she, she lived in this house as a girl and um, lived in, as a child in a traditional way and through her life she saw the change from those traditional practices to modern times and I knew her you know I, I knew her and I remember her and for, for me that means a lot but one of the points is like how recent um, the change from a purely Aboriginal lifestyle to more of a modern lifestyle is here for, for my family. Um, it, it's not that far away, I knew her, you know. Every single legal issue that Yurok addresses has some kind of cultural component to it. And if you don't understand the tribe's traditional law, if you don't understand even how things work now, your ability to analyze that issue in a way that is culturally appropriate is almost non-existent, right? So it's, from my perspective, it's a big advantage to a tribal community to have one of their own leading their legal affairs because you can do it in a way that builds tribal sovereignty, supports your traditional cultural norms, your traditional laws, and grows your society in a way that recognizes sort of modern times, but stays true to those traditional core values. Yurok always had a commercial aspect to its fishing way of life. So we always used salmon for economic purposes. The tribe 
regulates its commercial fishery very heavily through tribal ordinances, enforces it through tribal police and also through my office, through the Office of Tribal Attorney by prosecuting violators of the ordinance in tribal court. What's hard is that the, the fish have been compromised by things that are not under our control. We've had the civil rights movement. We've made great strides towards civil liberties, towards equality, acceptance. Yet, here we were in 2002, and what the fish kill was to us was a form of ecocide. And I use that term to mean an attack on a people's core natural resource that they rely on for survival. And even though it wasn't like an intentional let's kill all the salmon um, move by the United States government, it still was an act of the government that led to our salmon, which are the core of our life uh, way, being killed. This happened to the Sioux people in the 1800s. They wiped out the buffalo and then the Sioux people could no longer continue their nomadic buffalo hunting way of life. And if all those salmon go away, we can't be Yurok's anymore. We always take the friend approach, and that is an acknowledgement of the deep dependence that various communities have on the resources in this basin. Like, for example, with the farmers up the river, their livelihoods depend on the basin and the river and the water. And so in acknowledgement of that, we try to work with them. And I think we've been pretty successful. The Klamath Project was uh, one of the very first projects authorized under the 1902 Reclamation Act. And the Congress you know, provided for or planned for the development of the West. The general concept being that the United States would come in and um, I sometimes say be the uh, plumber and the banker. They would construct projects, dams, canals, what have you, uh, enter into contracts first with individuals and later in time with irrigation districts that uh, provided for the delivery of water to, for the irrigated lands. So the, the, the farms in the Klamath Project are, uh, you know, they've largely been farmed for close to 100 years or more. And, and we spend a lot of time and energy dealing with stereotypes about farming and, and irrigation, like you're hogging all the water and what have you. I believe that the value of agricultural production in the project, it, just the farm gate uh, production is about 150 million dollars a year now, which you know uh, echoes through the economy to probably up to about 400 million dollars worth of economic activity. See all this green? It's moss, and moss is a type of algae. And one of the water quality problems we have here on the Klamath is um, excessive algae blooms, which are caused by a lot of nitrates and phosphates being in the river, which come from ag runoff. So this is not normal, um, and it's a sign that the water quality is poor. It's so bad now that we really are at a, a, a turning point where if we don't clean things up, if we don't change the way that we manage this basin, if we don't change the way that we use water, the salmon are gonna go away. They're gonna go extinct. I don't think that we as a people who are, are put here to be stewards of this land should allow that. This river used to be the third largest salmon producing river in the whole like Pacific. And last year we, we canceled our subsistence fishery. We had no fishing, none, none. That was probably the first time since the beginning of time that Yurok people had, didn't fish on the river. About six weeks after that, we also declared a state of emergency because we had a string of suicides on the reservation. So put that together, right? State of emergency, fishing closed. State of emergency, suicides. There's nothing stronger that says how, how closely connected Yurok people are to the salmon and where my community is.
What we can do about it is bring attention to the issue to, uh, to make sure that people realize that the implications of pulling water to the CVP, the implications of pulling water to the Klamath Project, the implications of dams on this river are so bad and it's been that way for almost a hundred years. So we have to stop, we have to stop. I want to believe that there is a way to have sustainable agriculture in the upper basin, in the CVP. And I think we are smart enough, we are determined enough, and we are effective and efficient enough to find those solutions. Yeah, no, I enjoy working with Amy. I have a lot of respect for her. I have a lot of respect for what she's doing. Uh, I think we have a, a solid, uh, trusting relationship. I think she uh, isn't out to run over anybody, and and, um, and and we're not either. There's Eventually you come to realize nobody's going away here, and um, if, if we can find ways to navigate to, jointly to uh, some stability, that's almost certainly going to be the best and most successful way to move forward, and I think she has that sense. We, we want there to be more fish, <laughs> period. An abundant fishery is the best, would help us more than anything else uh, in terms of the stability that we're looking for. So that's, that's the work that we have to do. Because when we do that, we restore the river, we heal the river, and, and we rebuild the salmon runs. And then as a result, Yurok people grow and get better and get healthy. And then we become who we're supposed to be here. I'm very hopeful that those dams will come out in 2021. Removing those dams has the potential to increase the salmon populations by 80%. That would be it. You know, when those when those when we have a free flowing river and the salmon can get access to over 300 miles of spawning grounds like they used to and we have fish in the river, you know, that's gonna be a good day. We'll feel good again.